<laughs> now, the Yeshua and Prach and Nita Arbeli are right around the Hanukkah story. In other words, they're sort of like right after the right after the original victory of Hanukkah. Um, and um, and it was a time, incidentally, of course, of great conflict, as you know, the war of Hanukkah was also a civil war. And in that context, and now, I, I promised last week that I would discuss a little bit this concept of these pairs. You notice we begin with uh, Shimon HaTzadik, receiving from the men of the Great Assembly. Then you have a series of zugos, a series of pairs. Hillel and Shammai are the last of the pairs, we'll meet them soon. Now, what the meaning of this idea of pairs is, that uh, the, Sanhedrin, the, the primary authority, both, in ter- both as a, um, both as a, uh, as a uh, final court of decision, as the Supreme Court, but also as the legislature, also as the de facto, at least, religious government of the... Um, of the of the Jewish people was the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin typically had two leaders. It had a a nasi, the prince, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, and also was to a certain extent, even in the times of the Hasmonean, the recognized leader of the Jewish people, at least religiously. And then you had the Avvetin, who was the head of the Betin, and he was sort of. Uh, he sort of was the day to day, the one who ran the Sanhedrin day to day, and uh, technically the Nasi was on a little bit of a higher level. Uh, he had slightly greater authority, but they tended to work together. Um, and the last pair was Hillel and Shammai, um, except that Hillel students and Shammai students uh, saw things very differently. And part of this has to do with the fact that the Sanhedrin uh, ceased to exercise its authority in the times of Hillel and Shammai. But we'll talk about that when we get there. <coughs> so for now, we have Yeshua ben Parach and Nitei Arbeli. And again, these are all much before most of the people mentioned in the Mishnah. So they represent a very old tradition. So Yeshua ben Parach and Nitei Arbeli, so we're probably now, let's say, at around the year 150 before the Common Era. So they receive from the earlier ones, Yeshua ben Parachia Omer. Yeshua ben Parachia says, know three things. Make for yourself a teacher. And the idea of a Rav means to say, find someone who's sort of your primary teacher. Find someone who you are comfortable enough and confident enough in to ask. But, you know, have a teacher who gives you guidance. Who has, it doesn't make a difference who it is. There's lots of rabs around. But have someone you get a path from. Uh, the danger is spiritual, intellectual dilettantism, where you're, you know, when you take a little bit from this one, from that one, and you're constantly seeking the person who matches what you're feeling today. You're constantly seeking the person who agrees with whatever you're up to. And of course, uh, they say a broken clock is right, Back in the days of analog clocks, a broken clock is right twice a day. It means to say that you will find people who will intersect with one or the other of your opinions. So, uh, so have a rab, have some, which means to say, have rab literally means great. Have someone you're willing to submit to and learn from and and accept what they have to say. Uh, assuming that you find someone, of course with wisdom greater than your own. And acquire for yourself a, a friend, which means to say a partner, someone to study with, someone to, uh, to share whatever one's intellectual and spiritual questions are. Judge every person favorably. Before we get to the judge every person favorably, and the connection to the first two, there's a difference in language here. Asay lecha make for yourself a teacher. Ukenei lecha, and acquire a chaver. Asay to make, in essence, when you make something, 
you're the artist, you force, your, you, you, the medium, the clay you work with, submits itself to you. So, make for yourself a rab. In other words, submit yourself to a rab. It's a sort of, in a certain extent, a one-way street. Submit yourself to a rab, accept someone whose opinion, whose teaching, whose path, you're willing to accept, even if it doesn't make sense to you right now. But acquire, buy for yourself a chavir. In, in halacha, what is the quintessential aspect of a kinya? When you it's sell your chametz, what? Kinyan is a purchase, correct? Right? right. Well, it's an acquisition. When you sell your chametz, right? You give a, the the a handkerchief or a pen on the table. You pick it up. Um, you when you at a uh, before a wedding when they set up the agreement between the bride side and the groom side, someone picks up a handkerchief. The idea is that by me acquiring your handkerchief, you acquire this obligation I'm giving you. Kinei means to buy, Kinei means to acquire a, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, an acquisition by means of exchange. In other words, Kinyan, the assumption is that no one gets, the Gemara even says that with a gift, that if you would not have some benefit of spirit, you would not give the gift. In other words, all Kinyan, all acts of acquisition, are also acts of giving. There is always a reciprocal benefit in an act of acquisition. Because a kinyan isn't stealing or grabbing something from the ownerless realm. It's, it's getting something from someone who freely gives it to you. I only give you something if I get something. It may even be a mitzvah, like in tzedakah, but I get something. No one gives something for no reason at all. In other words, people don't give things away simply for the sake of destroying them. Like no one gives something away by chucking it over a cliff unless they have some reason or benefit to do so. So therefore, kenei lecha chaver, asei lecha rab, make for yourself a rab, submit. But u kenei lecha chaver, your chaver, the one who is equally important, who's on your level, who struggles with what you struggle, who discusses with you, who learns with you, who... Um, who you, who you bounce off the, the ethical questions you have and so on. You work on it together, it has to be reciprocal. A chaver, has, you have to get something out of the friendship as you're giving. And here we're talking, of course, in the concept of, of knowledge and ethics and so on, that, it, that it, they're, they're, in other words, you want someone who, who you can give and you can take <coughs> from and vice versa. You want a symbiotic partnership where you're both contributing. There's the kind of learning you get from a rab, from a teacher, and there's the kind of learning you get from someone who is your peer who you work things out with. There's the kind of guidance you get from a rab, and there is the kind of working things out that you get with someone who's close to you, who is dealing with the same things you are. So I say with a rab, Make for yourself a Rav, accept some greater authority, but a lot of what you need to know can only be accomplished by reciprocity, by working together with someone, by those listening to them, and having them listen to you, and arriving at a solution together. And here is where the third thing comes in, having done as Kaladam al judge every person to the scale of, of merit. What's the connection? Because you think, who should be my chaver? Who should be my fellow? Who should I spend time with? Who should I respect? Who should I discuss with? So you might be inclined only to find someone very similar to you. We say, no, no, no. Judge everyone favorably. Find someone who didn't come to you at first glance. But beca- and precisely because they're different, you have something to learn from them if you can see the merit in them. Don't be too timid. Don't be too conservative. Judge everyone favorably. Find someone who you can be close to, who you can work with, who you can create the sense of friendship with and the sense of partnership with, who may see things very differently. That's the best person to do it with. So judge everyone favorably. Don't judge someone unfavorably simply because they're very different from who you are. So this is the basic outline of the Mishnah. But this, this, the third thing is often interpreted as 
as, as being related to judgment in general, not necessarily related to the friend. So, like all of Pekiyavo, it's certainly true of judgment in general. All the statements stand on their own. But in them, you say, wait, what's the person's background? Where are they coming from? You know, maybe there's a reason for this behavior and so on. There's a lot of examples in the Talmud, you know, <laughs> of, uh, of judging people favorably in rather far out ways that turn out to be true. But, the, but here, he's actually taking it further. He's saying not only to judge people favorably, some isolated person, as not judging them as bad, you judge people favorably in the context of actually being willing to be close to them, and to learn from them, and to partner with them, and to, and, and to work on a community together, and so on. In other words, by putting it here, he says it's not just not judging someone ill, badly, and then moving on. It's judge someone favorably so you can be close to them, which is a which is a even deeper level. But the general idea that if you see someone doing something wrong, the first thing you need to do is to judge them favorably, and there's a whole pro. That's certainly true. But we can take it further to say that. Not only should you judge people favorably so as not as to think bad of them, you should judge people favorably so as to become really close to them. So is it the strongest presumption of, sort of, of, uh, of positive assessment of a person in general? I mean, can, we, can, can it be said that in general, it should go through life first taking everybody, looking at everybody, everybody favorably and then only changing our mind if we see something negative? Well, halachically, everyone has a cheskat kashra. Everyone has a assumption of uh, an assumption of uh, of goodness, right? Now, the Jonas from someone's a criminal is that behave as a criminal. But judging someone favorably, the cops close, means to say that you have a scale in front of you. You saw someone do something. You know something about someone, and you could judge it as negatively, and you could judge it favorably. So we tell you, put your judgment in the pan of favorable. Sometimes you only have one pan. In other words, it does, you know, don't stand idly by the blood of your brother. You see someone chasing someone with a knife, you know, no matter what their childhood, you probably should save the victim. You know, um, you know clearly you see, you, you know, uh, sometimes you can say the person's grabbing back what's theirs, but, you know, you'll see someone shoplifting, you can, you know, since it's unlikely that, uh, that, that, you know, the, the target stole that particular, you know, that particular, you know, uh, I don't know, bag of pencils from him before, you can assume that the person is shoplifting. If you see them, you know, secretly taking the package of pencils and, <laughs> and putting it in, you know, there's no cop's hus there. Where there is a cop, now, there's an after the fact cop's close. He had a bad childhood, he's a kleptomaniac, he, you know, he's very poor. You can, there are all kinds of judgments after the fact. What I'm saying is, is that, is that judging the cop's close means that if you see someone doing something and you could assume that it's theft, or you could assume that it's not theft, you're obliged to assume it's not theft. It's okay to be wrong. When you judge someone favorably, you could have been wrong. You're obliged to give them the benefit of the doubt. You're obliged, where there are two pans, to put your judgment in the pan of merit. Where there are two sides to the scale. So, so, so this means, so this means that any time, so there's two separate issues. One is the humility of understanding that even though someone does something wrong, perhaps, you know, they, there are mitigating circumstances, their background, their upbringing, their knowledge, or lack thereof, and so on. But before that, the kavschus means that before you assume someone did something wrong, you assume that they did something right, where you have the choice. I mean, the classic story in the Talmud is, is this person uh, hires himself out to work for someone for a bunch of years. And he's about to go home, and the, uh, and, um, and, uh, the fellow says, you know, I don't have any money to give you. He says... Uh, you know, perhaps you can give me crops. He says, well, I can't give you any crops, he says. So uh, perhaps you can give me from your livestock. He says, I can't give any livestock. So he goes home. Doesn't say anything, he goes home. 
So uh, about a month later, uh, this his former employer shows up at his house and he says, uh, and he says, oh, nice to see you. He says, you know, what did you think when I told you all those things? He says, well, when you uh, when you said uh, when you said I didn't have any cash, I figured you had it all tied up and in some purchase. So when I said you didn't have any any grain, I figured maybe you hadn't given the tithes yet. And when you said you couldn't give me any other objects, I thought maybe you had in your haste pledged everything to Hegdish. And, uh, you know, and that went to the temple. And that was that. He says, yes, it's true. He says, um, he says, uh, I, I had this incredible deal, so I put all my money into it. And uh, I didn't have a chance to give the tithes for whatever reason. And my son made a marriage I didn't like, so I decided he shouldn't have any inheritance. Any inheritance. So I devoted all my money to Hagdish. But then I realized that was a bad idea, so I had to go and find a rabbi, a great rabbi, to ask, you know, to ask him to, uh, to do Hatar at Nadarim, to release me from my vow. And, uh, and at the time I hadn't done that yet. So he says, so here, so he brought him, he brought him his wages and, and several uh, donkeys full of gifts and so on and so forth. But he says, I appreciate that you judge me favorably. So even though it was an implausible series, so that, that's what happened. And, and the, point, the point of the story is, is that it doesn't have to be plausible. It doesn't even have to be probable. Unless you're protecting yourself or someone else. Where it doesn't affect you, or in this case, you know, it's just a matter of waiting until the fellow paid him. But where you're not, where someone's behavior is dangerous, where you think someone might might cause you financial loss, that's a different story. But where it's simply a question of how you judge that person in the courtroom of your mind, you're obliged to create even an implausible chain, you're obliged to give the person the merit and benefit of the doubt in each and every case, because, because this, is, this is your obligation to assume that a person indeed has an assumption of decency and that they're not doing something wrong. If it turns out they're doing something wrong, then we have to think about mitigation. We have to think about being humble and recognizing that maybe if we had that kind of life circumstance up, I mean, we would, wouldn't behave any differently. So the, the, but judging every person... Now, this idea of judging people favorably, which means to say to attempt to see a positive sense in their actions, is the means that essentially we start with the assumption that every person who's doing something is doing something right. Any action we see someone do is right. So if you can make that assumption about people, so then you have a much broader range of people who to choose as a chavit. Clearly you don't want to uh, take as a close compatriot, a close friend, a close associate, someone who you're going to work on matters of Torah and, and ethics with, who's not a good person, but by judging people favorably, you expand your, your range of who good people are. So if you see somebody driving a Shabbat, you should assume that there's, there's a reason, right? You shouldn't throw stones. Well, in this case, yeah, well, judging someone favorably, if you see someone driving on Shabbat, there are several possibilities. One is that, uh, the first is that they, that it's, you know, that, uh, you know, he has some illness and is driving to the hospital, or that he's a member of some volunteer medical corps, you know, uh, which would be a reason. Or the next level is that the person is not really fully aware of the laws of Shabbat, of their implications or their importance. That's also the cops to the, the merit. But, but those who throw the stones definitely violate this. Uh, it absolutely does. It violates the laws of Shabbat too. That's another discussion. <laughs> In other words, ironically, I, I once remarked that, uh, I think in this room, that someone who throws stones and someone drives on Shabbat is... That a situation, the guy driving on Shabbat, or the woman driving on Shabbat, probably never was educated, was never, almost always, they have not been brought up to observe Shabbat. So according to the laws of the Torah, they're exempt from liability for driving on Shabbat. Because a person is only liable for transgression of the mitzvot of the Torah, if, as the Rambam says, if they were raised to follow the Torah. And if you grow up in some kibbutz, you don't know anything about the Torah. That's the unfortunate truth. 
if it's not, you know, it's quasi-religious one. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, if you grow up in a completely secular Israeli environment, the assumption is that no one ever told you that Shabbat is crucial. It wasn't part of your family's upbringing. Right? So, you're not liable. But throwing a stone on Shabbat, the Rambam says that if you throw a stone and break something, so normally, um, breaking something on Shabbat, Makalkel, destroying something, is only a rabbinic prohibition. Because the biblical prohibitions are where you actually build something. So you're only liable for breaking down a wall if you intend to build another wall in its place. Otherwise, it's rabbinic prohibition. But the Rambam, Maimonides says there's an exception. It says that if you, that if you hit someone and draw blood because you're mad at them, if you, if you are angry and smash something in your anger, yeah, if you break something to hurt someone, you break someone's property to upset them, since since from the perspective of your evil inclination, this is a repair, this makes you feel good, it's a, it is a constructive act via v your evil inclination, therefore you are liable biblically, it is a biblical prohibition of the first order. So if I throw a rock at someone's car and break their window, so I who know better, I have transgressed Shabbat in a transgression that is liable to the death penalty. Because I have willingly transgressed Shabbat that I know is real Shabbat. The person driving the car I threw the rock at is not liable because they never grew up with the understanding they have to keep Shabbat. So I pointed out that ironically the people who throw stones are the ones who are truly transgressing the Shabbat. And of course it's a terrible Chilul Hashem, a terrible profanation of God's name to, you know, to, for people with... With, 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 you know, with long coats and hats and beards and payas to break the Shabbat. So I never understood it. At any rate. That being said, the, the number of stone throwers is extremely small. I always have to add that caveat. The number of people who show up in Iran is small. The number of people who throw stones is small. The, the, the people who do those things that get a lot of attention are a very small number of people. And that being said, you know, the, by the same token, the people who deliberately drive into neighborhoods that keep Shabbat on Shabbat is also somewhat of a, uh, of a inappropriate provocation. <coughs> if you're a genuine liberal, if you're a genuine tolerant person, you will need to tolerate other people's way of life too. So that's, uh, but be that as it may, yes, someone who immediately jumps to the conclusion that someone transgressing Shabbat is indeed transgressing it willfully, is certainly transgressing the premise of judging people favorably. By the way, I want to make a very important point. The language here is to judge every person favorably, not judge every action favorably. In other words, an action may be empirically wrong. Theft is wrong, you know, breaking Shabbat's wrong, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things a Jew should do, but whether, that, but whether we should judge the person harshly for doing those things is a separate question. The person might not know, the person might have a mitigating feature. In other words, uh, the judging every person favorably means you judge their, their relationship to the action favorably. You don't assume that all actions are equal. You know, if someone says harsh words, you have the right to say, ah, you know, they had a bad day. But you don't have the right to say that those harsh words are appropriate. You know, someone might, uh, someone might do something because they don't know any better, and that's certainly judging them favorably. But it doesn't, <laughs> we shouldn't say that it doesn't make a difference. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a crucial component. The action itself can be judged, but not the person. And if we take that to, that, to, to the furthest degree, it means to say that, uh, that you can encourage someone to change their actions, but you can't define them as being, as being, um, as being fundamentally evil because of their failure to engage in those actions. So do you ever blame a person? No, you can blame a person. By the way, judging someone favorably, you could blame them. But you can also say that, you know, that, uh, that if I would have had that person's challenges and temptations, I would be much worse. 
So newspapers who find excuses for Boston church and terrorists, they are right? They're not necessarily right. In other words, uh, the question is whether those, uh, whether those claims are good ones. In other words, you judge someone favorably, again, there has to be a there has to be a pan, there has to have a scale. You have two pans in the scale. Well, there's only one pan. In, in other words, uh, there are clearly behaviors that are, and, and actions, you judge someone to the side of favor, but sometimes there's no side of favor. You know, the, the poor person who steals to eat, there's a side of favor. The rich person who steals just because they can get away with it, or out of a sense that the law doesn't apply to them, so what side of favor is there? You know, someone who randomly blows people up, what side of favor is there? At some point, you know, but on the other hand, to be honest, you know, some kid who grows up in Gaza and, you know, and someone puts a bomb on him when he's 12 years old, he doesn't know any better. I would judge him favor. I would hope someone shoots him before he blows himself up, but I would judge him favorably and feel bad for him. You know, there's a, there's a, there, there, that's the, that, that's, there's a profound difference. As long as there's two pans, as long as there's, you can say, hey, you know, this kid doesn't know any better. It's a great pity on him. You should say that. You know, in the case you're referencing, I don't know if there really is an option to say that. But judging <laughs> as long as there are two ways of looking at it, that's, that's close. It's an old-fashioned scale. As long as there's two ways of looking at something, you have to look at it the positive way. That's the basic. So the war can never be justified. What? The war could never be justified because you have to judge another people favorably. So what would never be justified? War. You've heard... No, because war is a matter of defense. I can judge someone favorably. If someone's trying to kill me, I can judge them favorably that they've been educated to see me as an enemy and, uh, and that uh, they don't know any better and if they really knew me they wouldn't see me as an enemy but if they want to shoot me I've got to shoot them first because I have an obligation to my life first. It's a completely separate question. Waging or even punishment. You know, the, the rule is that if you know the law and you break the law there's punishment. You can judge someone favorably and say, well, you know, even though we have to punish them, they're not really that terrible. Just because they, they're guilty of something very bad and have to have a very serious punishment doesn't mean they're all bad. You can judge people favorably who are serving long prison terms. Doesn't mean they shouldn't be in prison. There's a difference between the question of self-defense, of taking back what is stolen from you, even of crime and punishment. And judging favorably. You can judge a criminal favorably, doesn't mean they shouldn't be punished. Maybe it means you should mitigate the punishment. Okay. May I ask a Hebrew question? Sure. Kaf's hood, you say? Is the, the pan. Kaf is like. Uh, yeah. Palm. But it means a pan. So you judge them to the pan. That's my point, that sometimes there is no pan of merit. But where you have a choice, sometimes you can judge the action as meritorious. Something you can judge the person as meritorious, some can say the person did a wrong thing, and so on, but they're not as bad as someone who ought to have known that. What is schut? Merit. Schut is merit. It's like schut? Yeah. Zuchut is merit. Zuchut is to the side of merit, to the side of good. The thing is, it comes, it comes yeah. from the ancient the weights that it had, you know, like the old, yeah, old exactly. ancient weights. No, 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 my question was only the... The skoyot that uh, right. the alim gets in Israel is the same word. Yes. Skut means guilty and chuvah means... Yeah, but skut, it, it, it can mean benefits in that. Yeah. Skut means... Skut means uh, something that accrues to your, to your positive ledger, as if it were. Okay, let's see the next fellow then. So enough with this. Okay, next fellow. Nitai Arbeli who was the Av Beitin, the, the second in command, the president of the Sanhedrin, Nitar Aveli Omer, Nitar Aveli says, this is sort of the, the opposite um, and the complementary, keep far away from a bad neighbor. 
In other words, you can judge people favorably. And to some extent, it means you can expand your notion of who you want to be a friend with. But keep away from a bad neighbor, which means to say, if someone is a bad neighbor, if someone is, is committing negative things, you can judge them favorably, but keep away from them. And do not connect yourself to a Russia. And do not give up on disasters. Let me get to the first two, again, are easier. So keep away from a bad neighbor, but don't be close friends with a wicked person. What's the difference? A bad neighbor is someone who inflicts, um, who inflicts trouble on those around him. It's a person who is an active Russia, who hurts people, who steals from people, and so on. The Russia who you shouldn't be friends with is the person who is simply bad between himself and God. He's bad internally in his own personal life. So don't become too friendly with someone who leads a corrupt personal life, but keep away from someone who's evil involved, it causes him to be a bad neighbor, e.g. he harms other people. Now, and by the way, this is really, in both cases, therapeutic. It's therapeutic for the wicked person. If everyone keeps away from the person whose business is dishonest, whose, 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 uh, you know, whose behavior is destructive, whose, uh, and so on, so he won't have anyone to hurt. Sometimes the way to deal with a person whose, whose morals, whose be, you know, there are, we all are in contact with people who are combative, who are nasty, who are cruel, who are, you know, who are harsh in their words. So you know what, if, if someone is prone to saying harsh things to other people, don't let them commit that sin. Don't engage them in conversation. Don't be in his presence. If someone is dishonest in business, don't do business with them. Keep away from the bad neighbor, and that's therapeutic for the bad neighbor. By keeping away, he learns he doesn't have anyone to hurt. Precise, and the old, and he'll have to change his ways. Al tiskabe la Russia. Do not become close friends with the Russia. Do not bind yourself to a Russia. The Russia is again someone whose whose negative behavior mostly hurts themselves, whether spiritually or otherwise. The Russia is the person who doesn't necessarily harm others, but is. Is, is falling short of their own where they need to be spiritual. So by not not be not not becoming not binding to them. In other words, you don't keep far away, but there's a certain distance where the Russia understands that you want to be closer, but you can't because of this negativity. And itself is a positive way of acquiring the negativity. Do not give up from, the, uh, from disasters. There are two completely opposite modes of interpreting this statement. I don't even understand what, what, it's, what you said. What? This last, the third one. Valtisyoish, do not give up from disaster. You mean don't, don't discourage, don't be discouraged by disasters? Well, there's two, there's two interpretations. One is, Altis Yaish, do not give up, Mina Peronio, because of disasters. You know, don't, don't let bad, don't let punishment, and Peronio means disasters. It means, you know, bad things happening. Don't let bad things discourage you. The other is, Valtis Yaish, do not give up, Mina Peronios, from disaster. No, it's even if it seems that the wicked are having a good time of it. And, uh, and uh, don't give up. Ultimately, disaster will come upon them. Don't give up of punishment being visited on the wicked. The two completely different, and, and like much in Pirkei of it, they, they, both of these can be read this way. They can be read in, in both ways. The, the, the Chabad translation is, do not abandon belief in retribution. Right, so that's the, that's the second. That do not do, do not give up. Literally, Al Tishayish do not give up Minapranio, that those who behave wickedly. In other words, you say keep away from this bad neighbor, but he, he seems to be living just fine. Don't be friends with the Russia, but the Russia is, is doing just great. Yeah. I can add a comma and then it becomes what the first one. Right. Uh, do not abandon belief, comma. I mean, even in, when you see it in the retribution. Mm -hmm. Right. So the so the so the so the pro the issue is like this. The connection is the first, the simple. 
the second interpretation that don't give up on the on disasters coming to the wicked is easy, right? But the question is, what, what exactly? How does do not give up even if disasters are coming? Um, how do you uh, you know? How do you see this here? You know, so both the, 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 you know, so a lot of the commentaries say, look, even if you see the wicked prosper, don't worry, because things like with Haman, things can turn bad for the wicked very quickly, you know. Um, but, uh, but the other interpretation about the Siyosh Peronios, do not give up Mina Peronios from the troublesome thing that's come upon you, Actually, is actually is is um, is related as follows: that we tell you, don't be too friendly with with the uh, with the wicked with the bad neighbor. Keep away from the bad neighbor. Don't be friendly from the wicked, um, because obviously you want to keep away. You want to keep away from 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 trouble. So what happens if trouble comes upon you? In other words, should you assume that you're in the category of the wicked? We say no. Don't give up. Sometimes trouble comes upon people for reasons that has nothing to do with their being wicked. So avoid wickedness, but don't assume that just because retribution or punishment comes to you, that that punishment is because you're wicked. So there's keeping away from wicked people as a whole, but there's also from keeping away from the sense that you're wicked. Don't give up on your value if you suffer, because suffering doesn't necessarily mean you're wicked. In other words, you should keep away not just from wicked people, but from the premise that you're wicked. So that's how some of, shall we say, the more um, in-depth commentaries take a look at this idea. Now, I should say that um, that according to the the first and the the simpler interpretation, don't give up from disaster. There's a little problem with that. Why should it be important to you that the wicked be punished? What do you care? You already kept away from him. You're already not hanging around with him. So in the in the laws of fasting, the Rambam says that when that why do we fast when there's a drought or some other disaster? Because we have to understand that it often happens, obviously not always, but it often happens that when disaster comes upon us, we're supposed to improve our ways. Sometimes a, a disaster is mitigated by us improving our ways. And to imagine that everything is accidental, in other words, is it true that every bad thing is a product of our sins? No. But sometimes it is, so we should do, make every opportunity to repent in times of trouble to see if this won't remove the trouble. Because this is one of the reasons why trouble happens. Satis Yoishman and Peronios do not give up on disaster. It's interesting. It doesn't say do not give up on punishment. It doesn't say do not give up on disaster happening. It says don't give up mina peronios from the peronio, assuming they happen. And the idea is, well, to siyosh mina peronio, um, don't give up from the positive effects of the peronio. That even if the person's a bad neighbor or a wicked person, don't give up in a peronio that, that if all else fails, maybe disaster coming upon them will cause them to repent and change. So the idea is altis yoish mina peronios, do not give up um, from peronio, which means to say don't give up on them because maybe the, the, when trouble comes upon them, they'll change their tune. You know, like there's no atheists in foxholes, right? You know, like the person who says, uh, who's looking, looking for, uh, you know, uh, 
for a parking place and says, listen, we manage to give $20 to charity if I find a place to park. And all of a sudden the car pulls out as a place to park. So he says, um, so he says, oh, I almost needed you, God. So these are all possible interpretations. So now we get to the next, um, to the next Mishnah. And that's the eighth Mishnah. Yeshua ben Tabe and Shimon ben Shatah kiblu mayhem. They received from them. Now Shimon ben Shatah uh, was the brother-in-law of Alexander Yanai, the the most powerful king of the Asmoneans, but one who uh, who was the reason why we don't look favorably on the Asmonean dynasty. He first of all joined the Sadducees. Second of all, he well, he he uh, he killed his opponents and very cruel ways. He was basically a dictator and, and not a good one. So, Yudah ben Ta- and Shimon ben Shatak was the... He killed most of the rabbis of the Sanhedrin, except those who ran away, and Shimon ben Shatak also had to run away. So, Shimon ben Shatak um, and Yudah ben Tabai both lived through very... very uh, tumultuous times. And in the end, the Sanhedrin maintained its integrity and its, and its independence. And for the rest of the Asmonean monarchy, uh, the, um, the, the Sanhedrin and the rabbis and the monarchy did not get on well. At any rate, Yudhub and Tabe and Shimon Shatak received from them. Yudhub and Tabe says, this is direct advice to judges. Do not be like those who arrange arguments before a judge. In other words, don't be like a lawyer. Don't decide that you like one party to the uh, to the case because the, the the Jewish court is inquisitory. It's a panel that's supposed to be independent. So don't start acting like a lawyer. Don't start um, hinting to people how they should present their position. And when people parties to a case come stand before you, see them as wicked. If two people or having a dispute and end up in court, clearly someone's done something wrong. And clearly they haven't resolved their problems between each other. So let them both be in your eyes as wicked. And it's exactly opposite of the previous. Yeah. Correct. In other words, exactly why? Because when it comes, remember I said earlier, crime and punishment is a different discussion. The court has to do what the court has to do. In other words, when two people stand before you, don't right away put a white hat on one and a black hat on the other. Understand you should be suspicious of both of them. If they're in court, that means that someone's done something wrong and could be they both done something wrong. So when they stand before you, be suspicious. They're here because someone's not honest. So, so see them as wicked. Question every motive. When it comes, if you see them on the street, even if he's brought into court, judge him favorably, that's fine. But as far as his claims in court, don't believe anything, question everything, suspect everything. That's why it doesn't say see them, um, you should see them kirishoyim as wicked. In your eyes as wicked. Doesn't mean they are wicked. Doesn't say define them as wicked. But don't, when two people stand before you in court, there's clearly something going on, what does it mean, see the, so what does it mean? We say judge everyone favorably, right? That they shouldn't be wicked. But in court, you have to judge them as wicked. So when you judge someone favorably, you accept their actions and try to look at it positively. But in the court, judge everything they say as wicked, suspect, and investigate and dig and dig and dig. Don't accept anything at face value, no matter how good it's like. This is, again, this advice for the judge. In a court, you have to look. That's what it says when they're standing before you. Not if you're not their judge. Not, not yesterday and not tomorrow. Judge them favorably. But in court, trust no one ever. Question everything. Because there's something, there's some untruth here. They wouldn't be in front of you if there wasn't something wrong. But as soon as they leave you, as soon as the case is over, you should see them both as righteous because you kibbal lehem as din, they accepted the law. Now here's the interesting question. Two people come to you for a court case, right? And you question them, and you, then you doubt them, and you treat them both as wicked. 
Now you've convicted one is right. Let's say one wins, one loses. One guy cheated his partner. So why should you see them both as righteous? She says, because they accepted the judgment. Once they accept the judgment, then you can go back to judging people favorably. He didn't realize it was wrong. He was blinded by greed. He didn't. He, 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 he thought everyone does it. It's fine. The moment they leave, you can start judging them favorably because they accepted the judgment, and that's in itself a virtuous act. But the point is, the moment the court case is over, you go back, as someone mentioned, the regular judging people favorably. But until it's resolved, until they accept what you say, you have to be very suspicious. And what that means is that we often, and this is a warning against snap judgments, really, because we often, we might like one litigant more than another. But sometimes the, the very righteous pillar of society is wrong, and the drunk from the gutter is right. The law doesn't know anything other than the case in front of us. And that's the point that he's making. Don't be like a lawyer. Don't support either side. But at the same time, be deeply suspicious of both sides. Don't just not support, be deeply suspicious. And once they accept the judgment, see that as virtuous. Don't what. As far as the motives for why the, the person who did the wrong thing in the first place did it, you know, that goes to the last mission, the judge in favor of it. But in court, don't make, don't assume nice things about anyone. And the next one is Shema ben Shatach Omer. Havi marvelach korsa Be very abundant. This is especially a capital case. You have witnesses, be extremely prolific in your questioning of them. As the Talmud tells us, one of the sages once questioned uh, a witness who said a murder took place under a fig tree as to whether, the, as to whether it was a variety of fig um, with, that grew on black twigs or white twigs. In other words, be, be very, very... Because it's easy to make up a story, but somewhere down the line, the details are break down. If you keep asking questions about the details, you know, each witness separately, sooner or later something will break down. If you both saw the same thing, yeah, there'll be discrepancies, but you'll, you'll see that they saw the same thing. If you made up the story, you'll get vast differences the moment. So be very abundant in investigating the Aiden. But be very careful of what you say. lest from your words you'll learn to be false. In other words, if you show, you have to be very smart cross examined because if you show the witnesses what you're getting at, what you're looking for. In other words, if they sense, if they if they sense, for example, you know that there's that there's some problem in that and the angle they saw the murder from. And you're concerned they didn't actually see the murder, but only two people argued that a dead person. So if they understand what you want, they're going to adjust this story to make sure that they were at the right angle, if they're lying. So be very, very careful, and ask them lots of questions, but make sure that none of the questions give away. So, so here we're talking about basically a Sanhedrin um, that established itself as the authority that people trusted as opposed to the monarchy. So their advice is primarily for the Sanhedrin, it's primarily for the courts. Because obviously in an atmosphere where you had a cor corrupt monarchy and all kinds of other such problems, there was enormous pressures on the courts to judge unfavorably. There was enormous pressure to appoint unfavorable people. So Shiva Manchatap is saying, remember who gets to be a judge. And remember who's ju which judges you should pay attention to. And remember not to pay attention to anyone who doesn't live up to these standards. Because he lives in a time of institutionalized corruption, and it is the and it is the Sanhedrin and the lesser rabbinic courts that stood up to it. So here he's he's basically saying, um, 
he's basically arguing that the most important thing to know is that you have to behave in such a way that demonstrates your integrity. Because the only thing, as if it were, that's left is the authority of the law, and you have to defend that. So both Yehuda ben Tabah and Shem ben Shatah are deeply concerned about the, the integrity of the Beitim, the integrity of the court, the integrity of the rabbinate, and the integrity of the law. And on the whole, they succeeded, because it's to their courts that people came. But he's warning that without this... In other words, you didn't have the power of the military, you didn't have the power of the courts, right? They didn't have any of those things, did they? They only had the power of their integrity. So Shimon Shetak says, listen, if you want to save Judaism, let every understand that there's one institution, namely the, the Sanhedrin and all the lesser Sanhedrin, that the institution of the Rabbanut and of the court is, is immutable, is not subject to moving, is absolutely professional, and absolutely um, <clears throat> full of integrity. And what's, the, and what's the lesson to us? Why is this here? A, this is very good advice to anyone who sits on a court case. But more importantly, it tells us that in times where there are questions about honesty and integrity and bias, it's really important to go in the other direction. In other words, it's not in times where 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 honesty, where uh, where the validity of institutions are challenged. It's not enough to say, well, you know, this is such a messy world, a world of such corrupt institutions. We'll be only a little corrupt. The courts and the government are so corrupt. We'll only be a little corrupt. It doesn't work that way. The more the other institutions in society are questionable, the more you have to be extreme in your honesty and your integrity and your, and your carefulness. The more you see a problem, the more you have to go in the other direction. If, not, if before Abishim and Shaddaq's time, they were willing to accept maybe people who were less than perfect into the Sanhedrin. Once you have this corrupt monarchy and then corruption in the, in, among the high priests and so on, in the Beit HaMikdash, you have to go to the other extreme. And the one institution that remains, which is the Sanhedrin, and the rabbis of each community, they have to be held to an even higher standard of integrity. You, 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 you talk about the Sanhedrin a lot, but it, at the time when uh, uh, the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe had autonomy, at least in civil cases, they probably were guided by these principles too, right? Yeah, they had courts, not a Sanhedrin. But, it, but it's, yes, they were guided, but again, the, 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 the concern with integrity is very great. No, this is true in all times and all places. My point is, is that historically, this emerges as an issue precisely because all the other institutions were essentially corrupt. So that's not the time to, to say, relatively speaking, we're better. You have, to, you have to go sort of to the other extreme. Because if you accept corruption, if you accept bias, so you've accepted it. A little or a lot doesn't make a difference. All the guys above had three statements to make. This guy is Shimon Ben Shalak is making only two for some reason. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> That's very interesting. Here. Right, Yudim and says, um, well, Yudim and Tabe really says two. Because the, the second one is two components, but it's one. You're right, each of them, each of them only says, uh, each of them only says, um, yeah, and this is the only generation that only says two. It's interesting. Take a look. Before and after you have three. This is the only one that has two. It's a very interesting point. Two what? 
Two statements. And also the earlier, the, the um, and also uh, Yehuda ben Tavai is also saying only two statements because the statement about the people who come to court is really a single statement that's double. No, I mean, it, it's interesting because there's a pattern here. Maybe, you know, may, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a hint here that this was a generation um, that was deeply deficient, that many of the sages had been killed, you know, that there was something missing. There was something missing. And it might be a subtle reminder of that. Could be. But anyways, I, I don't honestly know. I don't remember ever seeing anyone reference this. So. Interesting point. Okay. And one more. So now we come we come to Shemayi and Avtalion. Shemayi and Avtalion are already deep in the Hasmonean period. Um, they're right before Hill and Shammai. Um, they were both converts, the children of converts. And uh, so we're now right around uh, we're right around um, ninety BC or so, maybe eighty even. So what do they have to say? So Shmaya and Avtalion, Kiblu Mayhem, they received from these two. Shmaya Omer, Shmaya says. Ahogas of Allah, a love word, who sanoas or abonas, detest leadership, while tisvada l'rashus, and don't get too friendly to the government. And this is, of course, at the time that Herod was taking over and so on, and the Romans therefore became the primary factor. So he says, look, um, love work, support yourself if you can. Um, reject uh, reject um, greatness. So the simple meaning is don't say I'm great, therefore support me, I shouldn't have to work. But also it means to say don't pursue leadership. And this is a big theme among, you know, among the, the leaders of the Jewish people, is the religious leaders. You don't want the job. You run away from it. Like motion. You don't want leadership. So love work. Now granted, if you were go to position of leadership, you might not have to work anymore. But love supporting yourself so you're not beholden to anyone. Hate, you might have to be a leader, but hate it. If you like being in charge, you're suited. If you want to be a leader, you're no good. If you want to run for office, you're useless. You know, and the idea being that that the that that a person that, that a person should A, have the humility to say there's probably someone else, and B, you know, the, desi the desire to rule over others is somewhat questionable. And Valdez Vadal is the same thing. You think being friendly with, with the government means, you know, you get special privileges, it brings you honor, uh, it, it makes you important, but the truth is, they're, you know, there's always the danger of being corrupted. There's always the danger of being misused. There's always the danger of be, you know, of maintaining your position by saying what they want to hear rather than uh, rather than what's true. Is it applicable to your cousin in Moscow? Depends. Uh, depends what he's doing with with Vladimir. I don't know what what is what the nature of their relationship is. In other words. Tzvada, you know, means uh, you know means to be you know to to get very well known. I mean, obviously, throughout the generations, people have to be involved with the with the government. Um, and rishus, by the way, means power. You know, um, it, it's it's an interesting distinction. You know, between you know between the government with the power is rishus means the the you know literally permission. So, Rashud is someone who has the power to do what he wants. Obviously, there's a difference between being involved in, 
a diffuse system where no one has absolute power, where someone has absolute power. That being said, uh, don't get too close to, uh, to power. It may be true. So hopefully he just gets close enough. What should I tell you? you know? Right. Well, it says, it says don't rely on them because they're only there for you when they need you, not the other way around. That we'll get to later. Yeah, but you mentioned something about Herod and, and the Romans yeah. getting strong. And so does, does, does that, do these things refer to, <coughs> to bad government like the Romans and Herod, or do they refer to any government? It's assuming that there are good governments. So it's interesting. So the, the Bar Tanura says, don't get close to the government. He says, if you like being in charge, then you'll go to the government and ask them to make you in charge. Then you become their creature. So Tzvada Lorashos is referring, don't become close to the government in order to acquire power, because then you'll have to pay, you know, for the, ac- for ac- for the acquisition of that, of that power. Um... So it's a very it's a very interesting question, you know, as to, I mean, look, it's clear that in the times of the Pirkei Ovis, all the governments were bad. You know, you're dealing with the, well, Pirkei Ovis, the Mish, you're dealing with the Romans. You know, the Romans are, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's like dealing with a lion. You never know what, you know, it can be very friendly, but you never know when the lion's going to bite bite the clown in the circus. You know, so you have to be careful. Um, but I think over here it's sort of what you what you put into it. I think you know obviously um, you know one of the very if you look at the Hanukkah story, the moment people ask the the, the Seleucid government the Antiochus to get involved in choosing the high priest, that's when you had trouble. How did the Romans get involved? Because because Alexander Yanni had two children, Orcanus and Astrobolus. They had a civil war as to who should be. <laughs> And uh, Horkinus came in on the Horkinus got the Romans to come in on his side, and that's how he uh, that's how he became the king. But once the Romans came, they didn't, they didn't go away, you know. You know, so they, you know he's just like you know, the, but when, once they came, they don't go away so quickly. The Romans picked whoever was weaker. Oh, for sure. But the goal was to insinuate the Romans are <coughs> cockroaches. Once they get into your house, they didn't leave so quickly at all. So, but the point is, is that, you know, is that, um, is that, uh, is that, we're, we're, is that what we're talking about over here? We're talking about the great danger of allowing the power to decide who's in charge of the Jewish community. The Romans also got involved in who would be the high priest, as the Greeks did, and that led to all kinds of problems. You know, one of the, the reasons why I hesitate to say all governments, because sometimes, you know, because here you have a different situation. In other words, here your relationship to the government is, in essence, that you are the government. Here, you mean here. In the United States. So, you know, after all is said and done, you know, granted there are dangers and, you know, in, in lobbying and, you know, and if you're too close to a political figure you want favors from, you might have to. Um, accept or support things that are against your beliefs, you know. I think to some extent it happened to Lieberman when he was running, you know, as vice president, you know. I think he swallowed things he otherwise wouldn't have. But that being, putting that all aside, um, putting it all aside, after all is said and done, the Rishus here is about my ability to choose it. If... Uh, if I'm seeking something, it's also because I say, look, I represent 100,000 votes or whatever it is. So there is, I think there is a difference. You know, Rashut again means the power, right? Rashut means your, like what is a, a Rashut HaYochid, a private domain? It's a place where you have the power to do what you want. So Rashut is about power. And where the power is diffuse, and where you're a part of that power, I don't think it's quite the same. 
But where someone holds the power and you and you seek um, to be to befriend them, there's always a, as later we'll see, right? They always do it for their benefit, right? It's as later as you referenced. So what happens is by even though you think it's really important for you to be the leader, if you acquire that leadership by 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 their goodwill, they're going to make you pay for that goodwill. And that that may be not that may be precise, and what you pay with might be precisely the opposite of what good leadership is. In other words, I think the the, the most important point here is that is that you cannot hold um, the Jewish community, what you know is best for the Jewish community, hostage to some other set of values that might not always go in line with what you want for the community. But it's also true, you know, where you, even, even in democracy, where you seek benefit from someone and someone offers you some financial benefit or otherwise, you might go along with things, uh, you know, that are not, that are not good for the society as a whole. I mean, you even see it in Israel, that there are a lot of things which I think are inimic were inimical to the Jewish character of Israel that were accepted and are not protested by the various religious parties because they received money. You know, so they, you know, so they were, you know, they, they were, you know, they were willing to, uh, you know, they were willing to, you know, to partner uh, and be, and sit for many years, sit in coalitions with governments that frankly, you know, could have done a lot more, or even undid many aspects of the Jewish character of the state, you know. If you're not getting money, you can say, look, we're not sitting in the government until every Jewish child gets some kind of basic Jewish education, which doesn't happen in Israel, necessarily, depending on the school. But instead, they said, do what you want with education, just give us money for our schools. So, Valdez Vadal Rashut, don't become too friendly to the power, is... Anytime you want something from someone whose value system isn't the same as yours, the risk is that in return for getting that thing, you're going to have to compromise your value system because what they want is something else. Does it also apply to leaders of uh, Jewish communities, like congregations? What do you mean? Like leaders of congregations here. What do you mean by that? Well, you have yeah. leaders. Individual congregations here yeah. have leaders. We may not sell the individual leadership, but maybe collective leadership. Right. That's the point there. The, 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 the request not to come close to close to that. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, there, there, there you're not talking about power so much as, you know, uh, someone, you know, the, this is there, the, someone has to run a Jewish community, you know, someone has to volunteer, someone has to be involved, I don't think that applies. Rishut means government. Rishut means a, a power, a body of political power who has a different set of agendas than your own. Obviously, we suggest that the members of the Sanhedrin be close to the leader of the Sanhedrin and that people find themselves teachers. The issue here is where someone has the power to give you something, but but their uh, their agenda and value system is different from yours, so what they give you may not may come with strings attached that ultimately are detrimental to what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. I don't think that hopefully if, if that applies in a Jewish community, then it's very bad news. Can we does it apply to the very low level of a lay person? Don't get too close to the boss, so to say. It may be again if you want something, if you want something from someone who has power at work, you know, and and and, and in getting that, that uh, might be inimical, you know, uh, to uh, to your. Uh, but you know that it's a hard thing to say exactly how that would work. There's no free lunch. Right. No. But the, the point the point is that you know if say if you want a favor and he wants you to work harder or she wants you to work harder. Then, there's no sin in that, but for example, um, you know, if, if let us say you 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 have a system, let's say you have a union, and uh, 
you know, and, and someone gives you an advantage on the condition that you tell them everything that goes on in the union meeting, which happened all the time, uh, that's, an, that's an issue. You know, c- c- you know conversely, uh, you know, someone who, you know, someone who seeks payouts uh, uh, from the union at the, you know, and derives benefit from the union at the, exp- and, and gives them things that are bad, and that's contradictory to what your fiduciary or religious or whatever duty is, that's a bad idea. I'll give you a. I'll give you a very. I'll give you a. a, a you know. I'll give you a very, a very, a very simple example. Um, you know, if you're, you know, if if you're uh, if you're responsible for kashrus in an establishment, and the owner of the establishment gives you tips, is paying you also, so then you're going to be not so inclined to call him on uh, some. Failure in the restaurant because you're getting money under the table. And there are numerous such examples. And it's pretty obvious, um, you know, what the problem here is. One more, one more point. Okay. So that's, so that's first of all, you don't want to be in that kind of, uh, in that kind of situation. If Talia no mayor, just one thing, but just a few things. Talmud says one thing. Chachamim, wise people, the Zohar of the Vayet, and be very careful with your words. Shema tuchovu tuchovas kolos. Maybe you will be liable to exile. V'siglu l'makom ayim arayim, and you will go to a place of bad waters. V'yishto el tamid abam acharei v'yamusu, and the and the students who come after you will will die. V'nim sashem v'schayim v'schale. And it comes out that the uh, that the that the um, that the name of heaven is uh, is profaned. So what does this mean? It means to say um, it's false. When it says Shema Tachovu Galus, it's about your students. Okay, be careful in your words. Yeah. Lest your students have to go in exile, and they'll go to a place of bad waters. So what is being said is as follows. Be very careful with what you say. Because even if you're here to explain, you say something ambiguous that is highly questionable heretically, that might sound a little bit heretical, you're always here to explain what you mean. But what happens if your students go in exile? You know, again, this is a time of upheaval, there's the Romans, there's the Asbanians. People are always having to run away because they offended someone. So your students will go somewhere else. They'll go to a place where heresy is rampant, where bad ideas are rampant. And they'll listen to them. They'll say, oh, that sounds a lot like what my teacher said. So because you weren't careful, you allow the pe- your unfinished students to go to places where there's lots of bad ideas to adopt those bad ideas. And nowadays you don't have to go to Gullahs. You just have to go to the internet. Um, and, and the point is that, that he's actually referencing the kind of thing that happened um, with, with, with Tzadok and Baisus. If you remember, we, had, uh, w- the, we started off by talking about the idea of serving Hashem, even when you don't have, um, even when you don't have uh, a reward, that you should serve God not for a reward. So some of the students who didn't hang around understood that to mean there is no reward and that there is no world to come. And therefore they fell under the influence of, of, uh, of the, the Sadducees. Who, you know, says, well, the Torah doesn't talk about a world to come. There's no world to come. There's no true reward or punishment. And that led to all kinds of problems. So he's saying, be very careful with what you say. It's not enough that it be right. It has to not be so ambiguous that it can be interpreted um, incorrectly, because then you might find that the person is friendly. You might find that your words sound very similar to Harris, saying you're not there to to challenge them. And and I think part of this is saying that there's a propensity among teachers. You want to say shocking and radical things. 
to get your students' attention. And you want to push the envelope. And you want to, you know, you might want to challenge the way they see Judaism. And tell them, hey, you know, let's, let's look at it differently. But if you're too edgy, and you're unclear, and you're basically tearing down their previous understanding without immediately giving them something else, so you're left with the torn down. You know, one of the complaints, and it might have been one of the only legitimate complaints, against Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed was that the, some of the questions he raises are relatively easy to understand, but his answers are extremely esoteric. So they sort of invoke this mission in saying that you have to be careful what you say, because you might leave people with the tearing down, but not with the building up. Now, on the whole, I don't think that's true of the Rambam, but it, it was a, a strong complaint at the time, because this is an issue that we, we always deal with. Very often you will see very, very um, deviant positions supported by statements from, from sages of impeccable uh, <coughs> reputation. I mean, there's, I forget it was, there's one great Hasidic figure, you know, um, who's, uh, you know, who's known for saying that, you know, that in the end, you know, even one's fear of heaven is in the hands of God. And he's making, a, he's making, he's making an important point that you need God's help to choose right. But many, but many people, you know, but many sort of, uh, 19th century, you know, an early 20th century Jewish philosophers, you know, and people, see, you know, they made the argument that you see, you know, everything's inevitable, and there's no real free will, and they used, I think it was the Ishpitzer, they used this, this, you know, Hasidic figure, you know, to make the argument that everything's predetermined and so on. It's not what he meant. And, um, you know, but clearly there was some ambiguity. So Shemayim and Tain is saying, be very careful with what you say, because if you don't finish forming your students, and they go somewhere where there are challenges, you might discover that this very edgy, sharp thing you said to shatter the complacency, because you didn't finish building it up again, could cause a problem. And the deeper aspect of this is that whenever you teach... Don't think about what you want to say. Think about what your student is hearing. This is the deepest point of it all. That you have to put yourself in the student's place and, ex and make sure that you know exactly what the student is experiencing. It's not enough to say what you want to say. You have to completely commit yourself to the student. And the word Izaru, by the way, means also be illuminating. Be illuminating in your worlds. Be clear. Speak in a way that the student you're speaking to can't but understand, clearly. In other words, he's also criticizing the premise of sounding wise by saying things that are hard and obscure to understand. You know, so the student goes, wow, I don't get this, this guy is so great. But that's not the Jewish way. The student says, hey, that makes perfect sense. And why didn't I understand that myself? And there's no wow, that's fine. Because you're not there to teach for the wow, you're there to teach for the student. And this is the deepest point. Well, welcome to Kabbalah, it's just very, you know, kind of a... No, but that's why the Kabbalah is, is, was originally only supposed to be learned by people who understood it in a very intimate level. Later, the Ari and others explained the Kabbalah in a systematic, scientific way that anyone could understand. But yes, that's absolutely true. That is why there used to be prohibitions against its study. And uh, I would strongly recommend against people studying Kabbalah without it. Well, that's absolutely the issue. But the Kabbalah was designed, uh, those texts were designed for those who indeed were able to comprehend them. 
we should only access those texts through the medium of commentary that enables us to understand them. That's absolutely true. That's why originally Kabbalah was only studied by those who indeed it was clear to. If it's ambiguous to you and unclear to you, you shouldn't be studying. The difference is that there's a whole range of commentary available today that makes this <laughs> thing clear. But what you say is absolutely true and the reason why there have been limits placed on its study at the time when all of Kabbalah was those Mister quite mysterious things. Absolutely okay. In other words, part of it, it says, say, just be careful in your words. That also means be careful who you say to what. You can say something to one person, but the other should inherit. Because they're not a vessel yet to receive it again. It's all about putting yourself completely at the disposal of in the place of your students. You are not the great teacher. You want to have great students. I think that's what we'll conclude for this evening. Thank, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Very good Shabbos, everyone. Thank you.